lives. Uh, and just some announcements. Uh, as indicated last Sunday, tomorrow marks the beginning of Christian Aid Week. And because of the current restrictions, there will be no door-to-door -door collections. Uh, there are envelopes in the vestibule this Sunday and next for those wishing to contribute. And also, as mentioned last Sunday, we resume Bible Study DV this Wednesday evening at 7.30 in the here in the church building. I realise the term study can conjure up thoughts of heavy theological debate, but really this is just an informal fellowship and conversation around God's Word. And we'll be using this book here called Proximity, uh, and really, you know, it's the book that provides biblical content and practical questions that aim to resource all of us in our discipleship journey. Please plan to attend this important element of our worship and witness here in Derrimore. And really, it's, it's very straightforward and it just generates truth, hopefully, uh, some conversation around God's Word. And uh, today is the last opportunity. If you have names of ministers, you would like the session to consider for a joint vacancy. Please pass any nominations to myself or to the Reverend Hyman directly. And I would remind the elders to wait for a short meeting and time of prayer at the close of worship today. And then finally this morning, we invite a warm welcome to, sorry, offer a warm welcome to the Reverend, or sorry, Mr. Norman McCracken, sorry. Uh, delight, always delight to have you back, Norman. Uh, so pleased to have you. Look forward to your visits and look forward to your work to us this morning. Thank you. Good morning, folks. Thank you, Sam, for your kind welcome. It's always a privilege to come back to Dermore. In Psalm 139, David writes, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. What is precious to you? Your family, your home, your car, your job. All these are good things and it's right to be thankful for how God has blessed us. Is Jesus precious to you? How many times a day do you think about him and what he's done for you? Let us pray together. Good morning, Jesus. Thank you for this great news from your word. To know that you're thinking about us all the time is indeed a concept worth pondering. May we all know the joy of your presence today as we consider your many thoughts for each one of us. They are indeed precious. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now we're going to praise God with him 108, O God of Bethel.
come again in our prayers of adoration and confession. Let us come before this great God in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, it is such a blessing to be able to come before you once again, to sing your praises, to tell you how amazing you are, to thank you for the countless ways you have cared for us in the past, and to bow before you in deep gratitude for the free gift of salvation which you bought for us at a huge cost. Lord, what an awesome God you are. Would you come to us today and inhabit the praises of your people? Would you minister to each one of us at our individual point of need? And would you visit even one today with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and transform us from this hour. Father God, we worship you for the many signs and wonders we see around us and the things you've made each and every day. In a day or two, the cuckoo will arrive on our shores after their epic journey from North Africa. We see them as nothing other than a cheat. As they sabotage the nest of another bird, they neither built nor deserve, and replace one of their eggs with one of her own. Then if that weren't enough, she she takes that egg away and eats it, and sits back while another rears her young. How cold callous and downright sinful of them how could they then if we step back we see ourselves in the cuckoo we read in your word that you created us love us and care for us yet in our sin we have turned our backs on you abandoned you and went our own way How cold, callous, and downright sinful of us. Then if all that weren't enough, you sent your son, your only son, to rescue us, paying that gruesome cost of death by crucifixion to save us. In your great plan of salvation, We, like the cuckoo, have access to a new home, your home in heaven, a home we neither built nor deserve. Is it any wonder we worship you? Lord, what an incredibly gracious God we have in you. Thank you for the many pictures of your majesty we see in nature and the lessons we can learn from them. So this morning, we fall at your feet in humble adoration and say thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your care. 
Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your dear son. And thank you for the cross. Lord, forgive our sins today. Create in us a pure heart. Move us even from this moment to fall deeply in love with you all over again or for the very first time. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to read from 1 Samuel chapter 1. Uh, you've uh, drawn the short straw. You've got me for the next two weeks. So we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapters 1, 2, and 3 over the next three weeks. So we're going to read the first 18 verses of this chapter. Let's hear the word of the living God. There was a certain man from Rathum, a Zuphite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeraham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. When Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went away and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Amen. This is the word of the living God. Boys and girls, I would just love used to be coming up and me going down, but we're not allowed to do that. So I'm going to tell you a story today. So 
This story is about three trees, okay? Once upon a mountain top. You might have heard this story before, but this is my take on it, so uh, you're going to have to endure it again. <laughs> Uh, once upon a mountain top, three trees stood and dreamed of what they wanted to become. The first tree said, I want to be the most beautiful treasure chest in the world, covered with gold and filled with precious stones. The second tree looked down at the stream trickling on its way to the ocean. And it said, I want to travel mighty waters and carry powerful kings. I want to be the strongest ship in the world. The third tree said, I don't want to leave the mountaintop at all. I want to grow so tall that when people look at me, they'll raise their eyes to heaven and think of God. I want to be the tallest tree in the world. Well, years passed and the rain came, the sun shone and the little trees grew tall. One day, three woodcutters climbed the mountain. The first woodcutter said, this tree is perfect for me and with a swoop of his axe, the first tree fell. Now I shall be made into a beautiful treasure chest. I shall hold wonderful treasure, the first tree said. The second woodcutter said, This tree is strong enough for me. It's perfect for me. And with a swoop of his axe, the second tree fell. Now I shall sail on mighty waters, thought the second tree. I shall be a strong ship for mighty kings and queens. The third tree felt her heart sink when the last woodcutter looked her way. She stood straight and tall and pointed bravely to heaven. But that woodcutter never even looked up. Any kind of tree will do for me, he muttered. And with a swoop of his shining axe, the third tree fell. The first tree rejoiced when the woodcutter brought her into the carpenter's workshop. But the carpenter fashioned the tree into a feeding box for animals. The once beautiful tree was not covered with gold nor filled with treasure. She was coated with sawdust and filled with hay for hungry farm animals. The second tree smiled when the woodcutter took her to a shipyard. But no mighty ship was made that day. Instead, the once strong tree was hammered and sawed into a simple fishing boat. She was too small or weak to sail on mighty oceans or even a river. Instead, she was taken to a little lake. The third tree was confused when they cut the branches off her and threw her in a timber yard. What happened? All I ever wanted to do was stay in the mountaintop and point people to God. Well, many days passed. The three trees nearly forgot their dreams. But one night, a very bright, golden, shining star poured over the first tree as a young woman placed her newborn baby in the feeding box. I wish I could have made a cradle for him, her husband whispered. The mother squeezed his hand and smiled as the star shone on the smooth and sturdy wood. This manger is beautiful, she said. And suddenly the first tree knew he was holding the greatest treasure in the world, the baby Jesus. One evening, a tired traveler and his friends crowded into that wee fishing boat. The tired traveler fell asleep as the second tree quietly sailed out onto the lake. Soon a fierce storm arose. The little tree shuddered. She knew she didn't have the strength to carry so many 
passengers safely through the wind and the rain. Then the tired man awakened and he stood up, stretched his hands and said, Peace. The storm quickly stopped as quickly as it had begun. Suddenly the second tree knew he was carrying the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the King of Heaven and Earth. Then one Friday morning, the third tree was startled when she was yanked from the wood pile in the timber yard. She flinched as she was carried through an angry, jeering crowd. She shuddered when soldiers kneeled a man's hands to her. She felt ugly and harsh and cruel. But on Sunday morning, when the sun rose and the earth trembled with joy beneath her, the third tree knew that God's love had changed everything. It had made the third tree feel strong. Now every time people thought of the third tree, they would think of God. That was better than being the tallest tree in the world. So, boys and girls, the next time you feel down because you didn't get what you want, sit tight and be happy because God is thinking of something better for you. There's a verse in the Bible that goes like this. We know that all th- that all that happens to us is working for our good if we love God and are fitting into his plans. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you that you have great plans for each and every one of us. We pray for the boys and girls of this church. Lord, would they know you? Jesus, speak powerfully to them. While they're young, that they would give their lives to Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to praise God again with these beautiful words. There's power in the blood.
There's certainly power in the blood, isn't there? Let's come before God in our prayers of intercession. Living an eternal God, we bring others less fortunate than ourselves before your throne of grace just now. Our hearts are heavy for all those suffering from the coronavirus and the effects of the lockdowns. Lord, in your mercy, would you bring healing and comfort to those who need it today. Remind them that you are in control and have their best interests at heart. Restore physical and mental health to thousands who are suffering today. Father, we're delighted to be back at worship again, even though we're still restricted to mask wearing and social distancing. Lord, we long for the day when we can share fellowship over a cup of tea or coffee face to face to encourage and build one another up. But living God, help us not to lose sight of where we were this time last year and how far we've come in tackling this pandemic and give you thanks for your hand in the process. We beg for you for a revival at this time among our churches where we would know a supernatural outpouring of your Holy Spirit leading entire communities to faith in Jesus Christ. Father God, move among us in resurrection power. Loosen the chains of the lost. Bind up the brokenhearted and heal this land from the bitterness of the past. We long for another Pentecostal experience, even this year, Lord. This is nothing to you. Anything is possible with you. All you ask for is willing hearts. Lord, would you make us willing today? Soon we will open your word, Lord. We pray that you would come in power and authority and speak personally to each one gathered here today or any who are listening to this later on. Lord, your word tells us that your word will go forth and not return to you void. We claim that promise. Use it today. Speak salvation words to some. In Jesus' name. Amen. So my title this morning is Faith Like Hannah. And this is scene one. The first and second, the first and second Samuel are two books about three men. Saul, Samuel, Saul and David. The author of this pair of books is unknown. And it's unlikely to be Samuel himself since he dies in chapter 25 of book one. It would therefore fit that the, the books are simply named in honor of him. Samuel himself is a priest, a prophet, a judge, everything except a king. Up until this time, various judges ruled the land. But God chose Samuel to anoint the first Israelite king, King Saul. And he also had the privilege of anointing the second and greatest king the people of Israel ever had, King David. But hang on, let's not get ahead of ourselves, for Samuel's not even born yet. This morning we're going to go right back to 1110 B.C. So the book opens with the account of this man from Ephraim called Elkanah, who had two wives, Hannah and Peninnah. Now, polygamy was never in God's plan of marriage, even though some great men of faith had more than one wife, Abraham, Jacob, David, and will not even mention Solomon 
with his 700 wives and 300 lady friends. I'm sure Valentine's Day was interesting in that house. But in almost every situation, polygamy caused serious family problems. It flourished where women occupied a low position in society and often occurred when a man's first wife was childless. The fact that her name precedes that of Peninnah could suggest Hannah was Elkanah's first wife. Now here's the thing. Peninnah had children. Hannah had none. Barrenness was something that completely consumed her. Hannah's every waking thought was filled with a deep longing in her heart to be a mum. And what made it even more difficult was that she lived in a house with a woman who ridiculed her on this issue at every opportunity. Yes, Peninnah's snide and cruel comments rubbed salt into Hannah's gaping wound. How callous and spiteful. Maybe you can identify with Hannah today. Perhaps you've been married for several years and have tried to raise a family, but so far, nothing. It seems everyone you meet keeps looking or pointing to your tummy and asking, well, any word yet? You look at them with their one boy, one girl, perfect family, and deep down you could bury your fist in them, saying under your breath through gritted teeth, if only you knew. I know a couple who longed for a child for years, but had no results. Three times they put their faith in IVF, spending an obscene amount of money. But still there was no sign of a wee bump. Eventually they went down the long track of adoption. Today they're the proud parents of a young boy who experienced an extremely traumatic start in life. But now he has a bond with his new mum and dad that is second to none. He's brought joy and hope to that home where for years there was sadness and despair. Folks, be very careful what you say to childless couples. Your ignorance could be very damaging and hurtful. Or maybe you're experiencing a barrenness of some other kind. The relationship of a friend or family member severed by some circumstance. There's not a second of the day you don't think about him or her. Your longing, just like that of Hannah, completely consumes you. When you see a crowd of people, you stop and scan them hoping to see a once familiar face. That aching void can be excruciating. Maybe singleness or the lack of a partner is your barrenness today. You've been longing for that soulmate to spend the rest of your life with for such a long time now, but Mr. or Mrs. Wright never turns up. You've stumbled through one relationship after another, trying so hard to make it work that you don't even know how to be yourself anymore. And nothing. Can I urge you in your barrenness, in whatever form it's taken in your life, to look to God for help? You see, the Bible is full of people with the same problems you have. In some cases... God heard their cry and answered in the most remarkable ways. And in others, he answered by giving them the strength and grace to cope and to accept their circumstances. Back to the passage then. What were these three folk doing away from home at this time? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 16 we read, Three times a year all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose. At the festival of unleavened bread, the festival of weeks, 
and the festival of tabernacles. The place Elkanah and his family went to offer their sacrifices three times a year was Shiloh. During every visit to this place, Panina would continue to wind up Hannah about her childlessness. And her husband, Elkanah, didn't help much either with his throwaway comment. Why are you weeping? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Really, Elkanah, was that the best you could do? How tactless. What was he thinking of? It would seem that when they were teaching diplomacy at school, Elkanah was off sick that day. As you can imagine, Hannah became very upset. Year after year, she had endured this torment. I can't help but ask the question, why did she keep coming? Could she not just stay at home and spare herself more humiliation and enjoy a few days' peace from Panina? I reckon the reason Hannah kept coming to this feast was that she had great faith in the God who had previously opened the womb of Sarah, Abraham's barn wife. But during this visit to Shiloh, things were going to be different. In her boldness, Hannah stood up and prayed. Here, what's that? A woman standing up at worship, calling out? Did you ever? This was very, very brave for her to do. See, women in those days, especially at the temple, were to be seen and not heard. Then in steps the high priest, Mr. Insensitive Eli. He thought she was intoxicated and suffering from an overdose of mouth and gear, brain and neutral, says, how long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Well done, Eli. Beautiful choice of words. He just assumes Hannah's passionate plea is the result of binge drinking. Which may suggest such behavior was common at Shiloh's shrine. The cool comments of both Eli and Elkanah seem typical of the attitude of men towards women at that time. But what I'd like to focus on is the change in Hannah's life. She arrives at the tabernacle, physically sick, unable to eat and in great distress. She leaves physically restored and in a much more contented state. What was it that changed her? She hadn't any guarantee her request would be granted. She was still going home with this vindictive woman. She was still married to tactless Elkana. So what was it that transformed her? Well, the first thing was her honesty. Honesty in prayer. Have you ever tried that? In Psalm 88, the sons of Korah wrote, Why are you actively against me? Punishing me, turning my friends from me. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? Unlike other Psalms, this one contains no good news, no hope, no happy ending. The writer, like Hannah, is being honest with God. What good is it to you if I am dead? Wow, how bold is that? but maybe that's where you need to go today. Have you ever wailed out to God in frustration? Can I tell you from experience, it's an incredibly liberating thing to do, and I'd recommend it. I have memories of quite a few years ago being in the pit of despair, sleepless nights, walking the beach in total darkness, Pouring my heart out to God in absolute agony. What I call God during those dark days and long nights, I'm not proud of. But you know what? 
he can handle it. He knew it was in my heart anyway. So what was the point of hiding it from him? I just couldn't understand why things were falling apart in my life. But then I was never meant to know. You see, you and I can never stand back far enough to see the big picture as he sees it. What do I mean? Well, let's say there was plans to build a skyscraper on the outskirts of Limavady. You've read about it in the paper. You've seen the artist's impression of how it will look. You drive past the site every day on your way to work. You expect to see progress, but nothing. Why do the contractors spend so long piling the ground, digging those deep foundations? Could they not just start building? I know if I was in that job, I'd have half the brickwork up by now. No, that would be a disaster. They know better. Folks, God is the only king who leads from the future. He alone knows what's round the corner. His processes and plans allow things to fall into place. He took me through those very difficult years to prepare me for something else, which he alone knows about. We read in Psalm 33, But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. So, if you're ever angry with God, tell him about it. He can handle it. Hannah offered up an honest prayer to your God, and you can too. Honesty in prayer. The second thing is total surrender. Hannah prayed honestly and then left it to him. She went home content because she was prepared to abandon the situation to God into his hands. Once she had given this longing in her heart to the Lord, her job was to wait on his timing. <laughs> How often have we prayed for peace and went about our day as stressed as if we'd never prayed for peace? Folks, we need to learn that when we take things to the Lord in prayer, leave them there. Now, that doesn't mean asking the Lord for more time to spend with our family, then taking on more things to do that doesn't include them. Sometimes we'll have a part to play. Lord, I can't be bothered revising for this exam, but please help me to pass it anyway. Yeah, seems comical. But are we not guilty of looking for a quick fix solution with as little cost as possible. Play your part. Ask God to help you. Then surrender it to him. I read this quote recently and I thought it was very powerful. Surrender is the crossroads between acceptance and change. Honesty in prayer. Total surrender. And finally, encouragement. Hannah went home rejoicing from the encouraging words she had received from the high priest that day. And after he realized that she wasn't drunk, Eli said to her, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She was so desperate for a child that she bargains with God, and he took her up on it. It's a very serious matter making a promise to God. Listen to the words from Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be free, few. A dream comes when there are many cares and many words mark the speech of a fool. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. 
fulfill your vow, it is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Not so with Hannah. She left us a shining example of a life totally devoted to God amid severe trials. So where does that leave us? What are we taking home with us today? Can I suggest that whatever circumstance you happen to be in, follow the example of this woman, Hannah. Give your life to God. He can do much more with it than you can. Let's be honest in our prayers. Let's learn to leave them at the feet of the Lord and take and give encouragement with a heart of praise. Maybe you don't yet know the Lord. Some experience in the past have robbed you of joy and you blame God for it. He's the last one you want to go to for help. Can I urge you in the name of Jesus, talk to him about it. Don't hold anything back. Get it all out. All that anger and frustration. He longs to have an intimate relationship with you. Take your eyes off the problem. Look to the solution. His name is Jesus. Give your life to God. He can do so much more with it than you can. Let us pray together. If you feel the Lord has spoken to you, make this prayer your own. Heavenly Father, thank you that you never give up on me. You've spoken to me time and time again through your holy word, and so far I have dismissed it, deferred it, or just ignored it. Thank you for taking my place on that cruel cross and being willing to give up your very life so that I could spend eternity with you. I really want to come to you this morning and give my life to you, but I'm scared of so many things, not least the thought of letting you down. Give me the boldness to come. I ask now that you would forgive me and accept me into your kingdom. Then I too could have faith like Hannah and live the rest of my days in service for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer, would you speak to someone before you go? Let us close our service by singing this lovely piece, God of Grace, Amazing Wonder.
Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>